because no, I, I, I consulted with a podcasting coach who was like, you know, just, just establish a rapport with your guests. And for us to be walking down memory lane, talking about, you know, our, our grad school memories and whatnot, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, you know, because sometimes it's like when people listen to podcasts, it's like, well, why do I care what this chick has to say on politics? And who's this guest she's got on here? Right, right, why do right. Care about uh, I understand, yeah. Right, right. So, okay, I am recording. And then now I'm going to go ahead. Is it, and... is it live or we're recording? We're not live yet. I oh, have okay. To... So you're like going to edit this, right? Yep, I can. I go in and typically like edit. And actually, I'm going to switch it right. to... We are about to go ahead and go live um, right, and okay. I sent the questions to you. So it's gonna be really yeah. informal. And um, so audience, for those of you who are watching, um, this is Quick to Politics and we're about to take it live. And then you're about to get that intro all over again. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome to Quick to Politic, the social commentary talk show. I am your host, Ernestine Lyons, and today's topic is investing in real estate and or buying a home. You know, just we're just going to be talking with all about real estate and, you know, just home ownership, home buying and everything. Uh, so with me here today, Unfortunately, my, my friend Denzel, um, who's also working in uh, the field of real estate, couldn't make it, but uh, we'll be glad to have him on another time. But we are joined here by Nicholas Shinistai. So tell us a little bit more about yourself. And I tried to make sure I got it right. Um, I feel like I used to, because uh, we went to Wayne State together. Uh, so we're friends from grad school. And uh, so, so tell us about yourself, sir. Well, uh, my name is Nicholas Sinistai. I was born and raised in Metro Detroit. Uh, my family is an immigrant family here in Metro Detroit. So they immigrated um, from a small country in the Balkans called Montenegro, where my family is part of the ethnic Albanian minority there. At that time, that uh, country was part of a a communist country. So my family fled that communist country, lived in refugee camps in Italy for about a year, and then made their way uh, to the land of freedom to Bronx, New York, where they stayed a year and then decided to come to the Motor City because of the auto industry to Detroit. I grew up in kind of like a quasi um, Albanian American family because I had the grandparents at home. So I had the ultra, you know, ethnic background from the grandparents where I learned the language. And then I had my mom and dad who were educated in America and spoke English with the kids. So it was like, kind of like a hybrid family that I grew up in. Um, initially, I wanted to be an actor. So I took a lot of drama classes in high school. I was a thespian. That explains everything about your personality. And I feel like <laughs> I never knew that. Either you told me yeah. that a long time ago when we first met, or I just assume I'm like, how is he able to just light up a room every time? And he's like, in class, he was always that person. It's just like, professor, I have a question. <laughs> yes. And then you would just be yeah, so right. like, you know, just got that personality. So, so yeah, that explains it. Right, right. Um. That, that's my wife walking in and out of the frame here, so we can all say hi to Violet. Hello, Violet. Nice. Yeah, so initially I wanted to be initially I wanted to be an actor, and and I took drama classes, and I I joined because um, I grew up in in Romeo, Michigan, which at at the time when I grew up here was a very rural community, and there wasn't much diversity up this way. So just to give you an example, um, I was it was myself and another Albanian kid in the school. So we were kind of, you know, the, the only kids with, with, with interesting last names in that school. And so I grew up in that system and I grew up in Romeo. And now Romeo has really, which we'll talk about uh, Romeo and Bruce Township specifically where I live, maybe even later in this program because of the way it has kind of uh, grown into an area that we, we're seeing a, a lot of people you know, move, let's say from Shelby Township and Washington Township and this once rural area 
is actually suburbanizing pretty fast. Um, so I grew up in Romeo, Michigan, and I joined the Romeo Theater Company, which was affiliated with the high school at the time. Um, a Miss Kendra Knobloch was, was, was the head of the theater troupe there. And so I developed, um, you know, a love for the, um, for performance arts. Uh, but when I got to college, you know, my, my dad being a uh, pretty straightforward business guy said, you know, son, you need to either get a degree in business or you need to be a lawyer or you need to be a doctor or you need to be an engineer because you need to think of a real job because I don't think that, you know, acting is going to cut it. So I changed, you know, and, and took a different trajectory in life. Um, and it took me a little while to figure out what I wanted to do. Initially, I was a business student, and then later on, I became a political science student. So I finished um, a degree in international relations, which was, we were the first class to finish with that major because it was a brand new major at, um, at Oakland University. And I want to give a shout out to uh, Dr. Peter Trumbor, who created that program, and, and myself and a good friend of mine, Andrew Bashi, were among the first graduates from that program. So I'm very proud of that, that we really uh, created that, that we, we, we were the foundation of that program at OU, which exists even today. Um, got out of college, we had the worst recession in history because of just a pop in the um, you know, housing bubble. We had uh, an economic crisis, stock market was tumbling, um, a, a major housing and banking crisis in America, banks going bankrupt, uh, people foreclosing on their homes, uh, you know, businesses for lease. I mean, it looked like Armageddon at the time, if I can really explain it. And so my generation, which is true most likely for your generation, because we're, we're one generation together, we got out in the market and job market where the baby boomers were all in their jobs and we had degrees in hand with nowhere to find a job. So- right. I took you know, very entry level stuff. I did free, uh, not free, but non-paid internships uh, until I finally was able to land a job at Daimler because of a German language background that I had. So uh, that was due to a, a good friend of mine uh, named Kola Goichai, who had also, um, he, he's a, a relative and also um, uh, somebody who, who was kind of a, a, an American dream uh, because he came as an immigrant with nothing, left a very beautiful life back home and really built himself up uh, all by himself. He got me a job at Daimler and that, that really got me on my feet. You know, I was basically taking European purchase agreements and converting them into English and, and U.S. dollars. And that's what I did for, for, for about a year. I did that. Um, and then, and then Ford hired me. So by the time you met me, I was at Ford Motor Company, but I really wasn't happy in the business field. It just wasn't me to sit in front of a, uh, a spreadsheet and tediously you know, follow items on a spreadsheet. I thought that there, there had to be more. Um, and I had some encouragement from my family to go back to school. And that's when I enrolled into the master's program at Wayne State University for political science, initially thinking that I'd maybe go to law school and become a lawyer. Um, but um, that kind of changed because if you remember, you and I really loved our political theory classes. Um, so right, right. Um, we were we were both uh, and just for like, uh, you know, for audience sake out there, we were both in the same, you know, uh, foreign policy or international relations. Uh, the way that Wayne State structured, it's like international relations is housed in the political science department, which also does public policy and uh, public pol masters in public policy administration. So all of those classes were all kind of like one in the same, but it was like me and Nick were like focused on international relations because of our love of like international. So, um, but we, we ended up having to take all of those kind of classes, you know, on political theory and, you know, politics. Yeah, and I think, you know, where you and I really clicked was that we were both, um, you know, really into national liberation movements. We were really into uh, so social justice issues. Um, you know, we came from different backgrounds, but, but found a lot of common ground in our backgrounds as well. And I felt that you and I really clicked and understood each other. So, 
you know, we were, we were almost like the three musketeers, me, uh, you, and, and Cristanti. Cristanti, yes. I hope, yes. She's watching. I Cristanti. hope so too, like Cristanti, like uh, I haven't, I haven't. Was, was, uh, so we had a very diverse group. Cristanti was a exchange student from Indonesia. Mm-hmm. Learned a lot about, um, a lot about Indonesia and a lot. I, I didn't really know much about Indonesia. I didn't either until I met Krasanti, you, know, you know, just like understanding, you know, the structure of the government and, you know, just like the the military juntas and things that, you know, were were prevalent there. So it was it was definitely a learning experience too, you know. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and then uh, in probably the middle of our master's program, um, I entered the U.S. Foreign Service through a, an internship, and I uh, had the privilege to serve twice at the U.S. Embassy in Tirana, Albania, dealing with, um, I worked at the political and economic section. So we dealt mostly with national security issues and economic issues at that time. Um, so the two years that I spent there um, were very informative, very nice. I got to go back to, you know, the ethnic homeland of my ancestors and, you know, live there as an American and, and get an appreciation and a perspective that I wouldn't have gotten just by visiting and, and coming back. Um, I really enjoyed my time there. Uh, the, the people of Albania are wonderful people. They, they left a, 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 an absolutely wonderful impression on me. Um, and I probably would still be working in some type of a capacity um, for the U.S. federal government. Um, however, as you're aware, you know, we had a family tragedy. My, my father passed away at a, a very, um, not a very young age, but he was 54 years old. Um, and, you know, he left my mom behind, my sister and his two elderly parents. And I just, I took it upon myself to make a choice here. You know, do I, do I <clears throat> pursue the career that, you know, I spent 20 years in school doing and through a recession, and, uh, through applying and you, you know what it's like to apply on USA jobs. I mean, you've got to sit oh there. Oh my and gosh. Up. And that's why, honestly, I was super jealous when you got a job working for this. And, 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 and it was like, just, oh I mean, it was a, it was, it was a freak so of nature that I even got it. Like, right. cause, cause you know how it goes. And for anybody that's watching, and has any inclination on, on um, you know, applying for a government job, just know that, you know, you got to have your alert on where it tells you when that job opened and you better have everything ready to just submit because they're only going to look at X amount. You know, you could be the highest qualified person in the bunch for that job, but if you're not in within that window, your, you know, your credentials won't even be seen. So right, I think, right. And I mean, like, yeah. I had applied for like a million, a million different positions. And I mean, like, it's just really, really tough. One of my friends actually just moved to DC, um, working with the State Department. And I think part of me started leaning more into local politics, because it was so exasperating, you know, going through that process, and then getting right. your folks up and right. then being let back down. Right. And, you know, I just felt that, okay, it's time to, you know, shift focus and apply yeah, that. international day, Bernie, local. You, know, you, gotta live, you know, you have to make a living, you can't, right. sit there, you know, you can't sit there and, and apply for jobs and think, okay, well, one day, they're gonna, they're gonna pick me. I mean, we're very qualified people, you and I, you know, we have a strong educational background, a strong uh, travel background, a strong uh, job background. I mean, you know, you yourself, you lived in Russia, you lived in China, you, you know, you're very aware, you're an expert when it comes to the BRICS. I mean, that's what your thesis was about. And that's something that, you know, um, hegemonic theory is very relevant in today. Like, I don't know, if, if, if I was a hiring manager at a federal level, I mean, you'd, you'd probably be on, on, on the top of my short list, so. Well, thank you for putting that way. But, you know, kind of speaking of, you know, shifts, you call yourself the diplomatic realtor now. And right. so right. you made that transition, a jump from, you know, foreign policy. And, you know, I remember how amazing your dad was. Um, and, you know, just just kind of being there for your family. And I think having, you know, your, your Albanian heritage, it's like family comes first. And I, I know it that does. it's it like, really you know, it's, it's really important to be there for your family. And so, you know, you kind of, 
made that shift from foreign policy to real estate. Now, tell, tell me a little bit more about, you know, that. And then I want to get into some more of the questions around, you know, just the, the housing market and particularly, you know, you being this, this realtor and, you know, kind of talking about diplomacy and that's always at the back of your mind as well. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so, yeah, when, after my dad passed away, I, I, I came back and, um, you know, I spent some time with the family and I reapplied for a position um, in Albania and I ended up getting that position and ended up going back and ended up seeing a lot of the old friends that I had there. And it was then that I, I really had to make the choice, right? And I had applied for a job at the U.S. Embassy in Montenegro um, and I, ha I got the interview and I, I vividly remember having a conversation with my grandma and my grandma's basically, you know, the whole family was like waiting to see like, you know, what are you going to do, you know? And, you know, I told my, I told my grandmother, I said, you know, I really want this job. And, you know, it is in, it is near the, the, the town that my family's from. And, you know, if I get this job, I'm, I'm really thinking that, you know, it's, it's going to happen. And so I did the interview and, and it, it, it turned out being a job that, that wasn't directly for an American citizen, but you had to have, uh, cause they hired like local staff as well. It was a job where you had to have a Montenegrin citizenship and a right to work in Montenegro. There was a lot of complexities behind it. So they said, this job at this moment is not a fit for you, but you know, good luck next time kind of deal. And so, you know, that was a sign to me that, you know what, it's, I'm done waiting around. I'm not going to pursue this anymore. I can't be around the world while my family's, you know, waiting for a leader is really the way that, that, that I felt. And uh, I ended up coming back and I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I had, I had a, a few good friends of mine, um, Adam Chesney, uh, uh, Mark Dushai, they, um, you know, brought me in and they said, hey, you know, why don't you try sales? And so I joined a company called American Income Life. I had no um, experience in, in, in sales, really. Um, and they really, you know, geared me up for this, um, for this sales world. And I mean, if, if, if anybody's thinking about sales, um, you know, really insurance sales, are, are very fast paced. I mean, if you want to learn on the fly, um, it's probably the best experience you'd be able to get. Um, and, you know, part of the reason, um, you know, I, I, I left that is because, you know, it was a very, 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 I commend everybody. It was a very demanding position, very well paying, but very demanding position. Um, and I felt like, you know, felt like I needed to do something on my own. I've always been of the mindset that, you know, I've always wanted to be self-employed. I, um, I, I, I never really saw myself in a long-term position where I'd be working for somebody or an institution because the ultimate goal was always to work for myself. So I decided to get a real estate license and I did the accelerated course. I think it took me a week to do the class, pass the test on the fly. And I started doing real estate and um, I joined a luxury real estate company in Bluefield Hills called uh, Signature Sotheby's International Realty, uh, which is uh, owned and operated by, uh, by Doug Hardy Jr. and his um, father who's uh, now deceased was uh, Doug Hardy Sr. who was a, a, a very known personality in luxury real estate uh, here in the Metro Detroit area. So by luxury real estate, you're talking like, you know, houses that are millions of dollars. Or talking, you know, really, I, I guess, yeah, you know, half a million and up is, is, you know, you could consider a luxury category, but typically, you know, a million and higher is, is an ultra luxury. And, you know, Michigan's very prime for that type of real estate. You know, you've got Bloomfield Hills and you've got communities like, uh, uh, the village of Orchard Lake, and you've got, you know, uh, communities like uh, Gross Point. Um, within the Detroit city limits, you've got the Boston Edison District, the Palmer Woods District, you know, Brush Park now, um, uh, Indian Village. 
you know, so there's, there's a lot of luxury real estate in Michigan. And then, you know, we've got the largest coastline in the world, uh, freshwater coastline in the world. So there's, there's properties, you know, up North and there's properties in Traverse city and Bay Harbor. And there's, uh, there's, 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 um, you know, the Saga talk and on the West coast. And so there's, there's plenty of, of room for luxury real estate here. I mean, we've got the most lake front, the most lake frontage in the world. So the possibilities are endless in terms of, of luxury real estate. And anybody that's from the down river area, you know, we've got gross eel, which is a beautiful Island with its own airport and, and magnificent homes right on the water. So, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find, I'd say, as many beautiful homes um, on as much waterfront as here anywhere in the world. So we are in a great, great place for that. Okay, okay. So now I am, you know, looking to buy a home. And, you know, I, you know, have, have been a renter. Um, and, yeah. you know, it, but it's, it, it's time to, to kind of make that transition. And so, you know, what is the housing market like right now? And, you know, what, what is some advice that you would give to first time home owners, first time home buyers, and has the pandemic affected, you know, the buyers and sellers market? Well, I would say that the real estate market right now is unprecedented. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we were scared. We were, you know, we, we were uh, non-essential at that point. And then once uh, the governor's order allowed us to sell real estate again, the market has exploded in ways that we probably haven't seen in 30 years. Um, so it's a fantastic seller's market, but it's also a fantastic buyer's market. And I'll explain why. So it's a fantastic seller's market because for the first time your house is now uh, valued uh, at levels, uh, you know, just pre-recession. So a lot of the properties that you look at, the last time they ever sold for this high was, was you know, right before the bubble burst. Um, so right, why, I, I have to notice the buyers market. market woods, like, you know, the, the home values on, you know, some of our streets where, you know, the houses are a little bigger, um, they're going for like, you know, 240,000 and right. you know, they right. have been as low as like, you know, I know that there are some houses that go for maybe 40,000, 50,000. And right. you know, that was, you know, they haven't been that high in the hundred thousand since, you know, before the recession. So that's actually, it's good to see that return. Right. And, and, you know, why, why is it a good buyer's market if the prices are so high? And I'll explain that because the interest rates are so low. You can basically, as a buyer right now, you can pretty much borrow money uh, at, at the lowest rates ever. Um, so just to give you an example, I'm working with an individual right now who's, uh, rate is, is around 2.7%. Okay. Um, let's just for mathematical purposes, right? If you finance a $200,000 home at 2.7%, okay, that's like, um, that's pretty much like you financing a $100,000 home a few years ago at, you know, North, a little north of 5%. So in the long run, when you amortize the amount of money you'll be paying for that house because the interest rate is so low, it comes out the same as you buying it at a, at a lower price a few years ago. So that's why it's, you know, it's a good seller's market, but it's also a good buyer's market. The only hindrance that you have with buyers right now is that there's no inventory out there. So it is, it is like a swarm of bees if a good property hits the market. Right. And that property is priced right. It's priced to sell. It's priced with a comparable that has sold, let's say, in the last six months in that community. You know, that thing is going to be sold with multiple offers. Oh, for sure. You know, this, this happens to me. Yes, it's 24 hours because I know I looked at a property and I'm just like, okay, well, this one is in, is on one of the streets that I want to be on. And then it's like, you know, I'm going to go just, you know, take a look and then get everything else, you know, lined up and put in an offer. And then it's like, it's gone. And this keeps happening because they're, right. you know. It's, so it's the, bad, the bad part about this is there's not enough time to think in this market. 
because it's it's just moving that fast because uh, there's no inventory and there's a lot of buyers. So everybody's swarming. So the, the buyers that have been looking for a long time, they're kind of experienced. They know the values, they know what's up. So, you know, they'll put in uh, sometimes people that have the, the, the wherewithal to, you know, put in a cash offer, you know, they'll, they'll come in a showing and maybe bring somebody, you know, who, who knows construction and, you know, the, the, the guy who can, it can almost, you know, a, uh, look at it like an inspector kind of right away. It'll look at it and say, well, this looks good, you know, uh, offer cash and do, a, do an appraisal guarantee where you'll even agree to, to uh, uh, put more money um, if, if push comes to shove just so you can get this property. I mean, it's really a crazy market out there. Let me ask you this. Is it normal to like, okay, I'm going to put down cash for this, like for if a house is going for 60 or 70 or something? It's just I've, like, seen, I've seen I've seen everything. Go nothing surprises me anymore. I mean, I've seen everything. I mean, typically, you know, the majority of people need the finance. Right. They would normally get a mortgage, but like, is this a new phenomenon? Because, you no, know, not really, not are, really. And, and I think that even now, I mean, even though like, you know, like obviously a cash, no inspection is, is beautiful because it's pretty much a done deal. We don't have to wait for financing or think um, whether that person can get financing. Now, you know, it's it's common practice that we we have a pre-approval uh, document with every offer so that the seller side knows that you know this person can qualify for that loan but anytime you know there's minor complications in each deal it, it it's it's like a markdown of points right so okay this person needs financing uh this person wants an inspection you know um this person or this individual, um, I just lost my train of thought. Um, like inspections and, you know, having right. appraisers come. Right. So and the more the contingency. So um, yeah, th this person wants um, concessions, you know, they want their closing costs paid. So each one of those add-ons diminishes your, you know, or you, you submitted the offer and you didn't submit a pre-approval. And so you need to build your case. You know, as a buyer, you have to build your case. You know, how much is this person putting down? How much is their earnest money deposit? You know, all these factor in on, on what looks like a strong, you know, offer. If we see that he's financing, but he's putting half down, you know, you know, that's a serious buyer right there. That's putting half the amount down, for example. So, um, you know, I've had several multiple offer situations where we've had to sit down with the seller and really go through, okay, who's the, who's the strongest offer here? That's, that's, that's amazing. And I guess like, you know, when you think about it, that, you know, the pandemic has really created the sense of, okay, well, in some ways it's instability, but in other ways it's people's wanting to, you know, just kind of rely on something stable. Um, so shifting into, you know, for example, you, once you own a home and you want to invest in a second home or start investing in property in general, what are some barriers, you know, um, to, to kind of breaking into that investing market and where are some great places to invest? And, um, you know, just as far as, you know, ideal situations for investment homes. Um, so do you want to talk about just investment homes or do you want to talk about investment properties in general where we include also commercial properties as well? Mm, I think we'll stay away from commercial we'll properties with homes. Like when it comes to like, mm -hmm. So um, whenever you're doing an investment type of property, you have to keep in mind that normally the banks will want more down than if it's for a personal home. So if it's going to be like a non-homesteaded uh, investment type property, you're going to need more cash down and your interest rate is going to be higher uh, in general. Um, and that's just kind of the name of the game. Your taxes are going to be higher as well. Um, and you need to factor in, you know, let's say you, you purchase a home and I, I assume that you're, you're, you're speaking about purchasing an investment home and, and renting that home or are you, are you speaking about Yes, like so that it's, it, it's, you know, you're renting it and you're taking that income towards, you know, maybe that second mortgage or something that's part of that investment, right. whatever it right. takes. Right. So, you know, typically, typically you want 
a good cap rate. So uh, just to give you an example, if you buy that house, uh, just, and again, these are just rough numbers and, and this is not, you know, if, if you buy a house for 180,000 and you can rent it um, for 1800 a month and that covers your, um, your, your payment and your taxes, you're doing pretty good. So, you know, really if you're, if you're a consumer at this point and you're looking to invest, you know, you want to look at all those things. You want to look at the comparables. If it is a fixer upper, you know, you want to look at, okay, what's it going to cost me uh, to purchase this home? What's it going to cost me to update this home? Uh, then you got to factor in, can I get a renter? So you got to look at comparables. Are, uh, are homes renting in this community? Because actually right now, you know, it's, it's really a good time to buy. So people would rather buy than rent. You know, if, if you can own the home rather than rent it, you know, right now you're getting a good interest rate. Um, your, your payments will be, will be good. You know, you, you got to look at all those things. Are people renting in that community? Will that rent cover your expenses? Is it worth your time, you know, to put in your, your, your time, to put in your money in that property uh, to come back? Because I think essentially, even though we have dips that the overall trend is that real estate always appreciates. So um, going back to political science, you know, wars are not fought over uh, watches. They're not fought over cars. They're not fought over commodities. They're fought over land, real estate. That's why cash is, is worthless. Cash is just, is just something that the government prints for us so we can go buy stuff with it. But at the end of the day, what is real estate? What is a real wealth is, is a, a, a property or land. And land right. is always worth more when there's, when there's something on it than when there's nothing on it. Exactly. And this is why, like, honestly, land ownership is the first step towards generational wealth and creating that generational wealth. Exactly. You have exactly. To pass your kids. It's like passing down a watch to your kid. Okay. Yeah. Right. That might have some value, but you know, it really depends on a lot of too many variables to, yeah. to actually yeah. make it that something that they can actually stake their future on. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's really important. And I think it's something that you know, just even finance, finance and wealth management. I think the last three episodes of Quick to Politic kind of focus on some of these things because, you know, and I know that uh, I've been a really big champion of some of these workshops we've had, even in my own community around, you know, having uh, not only finance workshops, making sure that you understand, you know, where your credit stands, how to invest and, you know, um, you know, knowing what's a gimmick and knowing what's not and what approaches to take it's really important to be able to create that wealth and then also understand your money correct, so correct. that you can provide, you know, for yourself for the future. So. Correct. Absolutely. And I highly encourage, you know, that people who are maybe not sure, you know, go to a loan officer, you know, go to a loan officer that, that, that you might know. Um, you know, I do a lot of work with Paul Shkreli at Wall Street Lending, you know, Go see somebody like Paul um, and see what you can qualify for. You know, that way you'll know what the bank thinks that you can afford you know, or what the bank tells you that you can afford. And so that way you can start looking for properties that are, you know, at your level. Because, you know, for example, me, I, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to own um, a high rise in South Beach right on the beach, but you know, maybe right now I can just afford a rental home that's right next door to my house. And if I can afford it and it comes up for sale, you know, yeah, I'd love to buy it. And, and look, let's just start with that rental home right now and then have maybe two rental homes and then have three or four or five, 10, 20, and then eventually get into the commercial space and then eventually have my high rise in, in, uh, in South Beach, you know? <laughs> exactly, but you gotta start somewhere. And I think it's also to, maybe me and you both are into a lot of that new agey kind of like motivational speak, speak and right, right. talk about like, you don't let, don't tell yourself no, let them tell you no, but at least go out and try. And then also be, you know, that person who's gonna take the initiative to start getting the ducks in a row. Um, which is why it's been like a month worth of, or two months worth of, you know, financial kind of, you know, getting your ducks in a row exactly. and then invest, make exactly. these investments in yourself. And then my next, I think the next topic is also even going to be like, 
you know, Valentine's Day investing in yourself, you know? Right, right. You really do have to. I mean, that's what it's all about. It's all about investing in yourself and building a brand. I mean, when I started in real estate, I did, I, I had no clue. You know, I didn't know how to write a purchase agreement, you know, and it's, you, you got to thank the people that give you a chance to, because, you know, I remember I, I got a few of my friends together and I said, hey guys, you know, just want to let you know. And I had changed a bunch of careers by that point. You know, I, uh, it, it was really, you know, my life has really been, a, a, um, a, a self-discovery journey in itself. You know, I went all over the world to see if I could, you know, live in other places. And eventually I came back to where I grew up and I love it. I wouldn't change any of it for the world. So I got together with these friends and I just handed out my business cards. Hey guys, just want to let you know I'm doing real estate. And within the month I had two sales and it was, you know, it, it broke the ice. And so I'll never forget. And I tell those, um, First clients, they know who they are. Um, I have one that's, you know, started as a, a, a very, you know, he bought, he bought, you know, um, he started off, you know, he bought a, a vacant lot from me and then he worked his way up and he's buying, you know, commercial buildings from me now. So, you know, and these are the people that, you know, you kind of grow together with your clients too. You know what I mean? It's like, and, and you never forget the ones that gave you the the the, the shot. So right, I right. Appreciate that you guys know who you are, and uh, I'm, you were the king of name dropping, so I'm surprised you didn't say it. Like, shout out yeah, to no, no, <laughs> so, like, but the, but no, no, it's it's really it's really yeah, important. The, the thing too. is, I I, I mm -hmm. part part of part of my real estate strategy is you know I'm not the realtor that's going to take a picture of my uh, uh, of my client at the closing table. Um, my real estate is done more at a confidential level. You know, I don't, I, I don't think a lot of my clients don't like people knowing their business. Um, one, you know, I've got clients that don't even want people to know that they're interested in the property because they don't want, let's say, competition to come in and maybe raise the price. So for me, you know, confidentiality in my uh, line, some, some people, um, you know, they love to show off their customers I like to keep it more confidential because that's just the way I do business. And then my social media is a little bit more, uh, you know, geared toward- Not in front of all of these wonderful houses and things like- <laughs> Right, right, right. So, you know, that's that's just, I guess, the approach I, I take. And, and even on the social media aspect, I mean, that has changed the game immensely as well. Um, you know, I- um, I thought for a while it was useless because I pay for these Facebook ads. And if anybody's a realtor out there starting up and is starting to pay for ads, I used to pay for ads and I wasn't getting any action from those ads. Like, you know, you, you set up, you set the budget with Facebook and you set a target area and a target market and, 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 and you, you, you run the promos and you run the ads and you don't get any action. It's like, man, you, you get frustrated by it. But I just think that over time, you know, you get more followers, you, you start producing more content, and that's when you start getting that social media um, efficacy. So I had like three or four calls this week from people that said, oh, I saw a property or I saw a listing on your Facebook, was wondering if you could show it to me, was wondering if it was still available. So I'm just now, I'm like, oh, you know, um, 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 three so reaping the benefits of what you saw. Yeah, I'm three had. years in the game, and, and just now people are telling me that they're seeing stuff on social media. So don't give up. The bottom line is like, if anybody's in this business, you know, don't give up. Give it a chance. It's a, it's a, it's a gig that's 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 you know more than just a year. Um, stay in there, and you're going to reap the benefits. Just work hard. Be honest. Um, do your work ethically, and and you will succeed. Right. And, you know, it's, it's so funny that like um, you said like Facebook ads, because, um, you know, there, there's there's a there's a woman who um, is a local entrepreneur and she won our Harper Wood soup. And I had her on one of our like Build Institute shows talking about, you know, just promoting small businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, and, you know, she was saying use those Facebook ads and because we we really do have to be like more innovative as far as how we create careers for ourselves and you know this is this is maybe the entrepreneur in me or the person who believes in entrepreneurial endeavors um but i also think that for 
me and you are the same age. We were both born in 86. And so like, you know, I think that as millennials, we do have to start to think like with, with more of a hustler mentality where it's like, okay, um, you have to have that side thing. You have to have that other thing because, you know, maybe the 2020s are going to show that, especially with the pandemic, you have to show that like, you have to be willing to pivot. You have to be able to shift and you have to be able to, you know, move on to something else or turn one thing you thought was going to be like this, this, this bulletproof industry and then shift it into something that works for you. And I think that that is something that we're seeing careers are not going to be the same as they were. And I think that also with so many people out of work, I think it does have to take that leveling up. And then, you know, I know I've taken on additional things since the pandemic, just to be able to make sure that I'm, you know, staying where I need to be financially. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad you hit on those points. Well, um, and, and this just kind of uh, bounce off of your point. You know, I think that, you know, conventionally, or, or, you know, what it was like maybe um, the past decades, it was, you know, you went to school, you got a college education, you got a job. I think that, you know, taking in comparison people that graduated in the 50s and 60s and people who graduate now, you know, there were a lot less people graduating back then than are now. Most, most people, you know, there's a lot more people with college degrees and, you know, there, there's, a, we live in a globalized world where, you know, uh, U.S. companies hire people from overseas as well. So you have a lot of competition when it comes to the job market. And I, I just don't think that the college degree is as secure of an avenue in, in securing the lifestyle that you want as it used to be. You know, before you, you, you right. got a college degree and you got a, a great paying job and if it was, you know, a husband and a wife both working, you know, that's what my parents did. They, they got a, uh, they got an undergrad, they got a graduate degree, they got great jobs in great companies uh, right off the bat. And, and I mean, we had a beautiful life as kids. Right, I mean, and then be able to live the American dream. It's same, were, same they, in my case. They were able, they were able with a, with a nine to five to, to live a, 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 you know, upper middle class life, which, which I think it's, it's much harder to do that now than it was back then. Now, you mentioned something about, um, you know, being able to pivot, but at this point in my life, I pivoted a lot in my life. And so, you know, I think that if you're spending a lot of time in something and it's not bearing fruit for you, you have to make a decision. Like, do I keep going or do I, do I, do I do something else? Right. And so that's, that's what kept happening to me is I was, I was hitting a brick wall in a lot of different um, industries and, and, and in different sectors that, that I was in. And, and that kind of forced me to, to try different things and that eventually led me to real estate. And so, but at the same time, like now I'm in real estate. And I think that when an individual gets up to a certain age, because I think like, obviously, you know, when you're younger, and you have the you have the time and you have the ambition by all means you know don't let anybody diminish your ambition don't let anybody diminish your dream because most of the people that are going to try to diminish your dream are the ones that regret not following their own so they're going to want to they're going to want to derail you from yours um, but once you get to that point where you're established and you know you have a, a steady stream of income uh, uh, doing a craft that you enjoy, um, there's no room for plan B at that point because then plan B just takes away energy and takes away resources from plan A. I think that once you've solidified and that, and that you've, you've created a foundation for plan A, there is no room for plan B. There's always room for diversifying. Um, but I think I'm, I'm like a, I'm like a all chips in or nothing kind of guy. So uh, for me at this point in my life, you know, it's, it's, it's plan A, pedal to the metal, and, and, you know, that's all she wrote kind of deal. Exactly, exactly. And I think that, you know, sometimes it's, it's more about the fact that you, you really do have to put in the work and you're not going to see dividends when you're, you're like, okay, well, it's time to jump out of this and jump into something else. It's exactly. like, no, stay the course exactly. and, you know, keep working towards things. And I think that we do need motivation and, you know, 
this is why I like to talk to like-minded people um, to, to keep us going when it comes to like, you know, overcoming adversity and overcoming, you know, barriers and things, you know, you just got to keep at it. So um, as we wrap up, I want to uh, jump into our hot take on political issues. Uh -huh. So a real rapid fire is going to be like, to all right, you're going to get all the questions. Okay. So what is your hot take right now on current political issues? And let's talk about the Biden executive orders. Thoughts? Well, um, <laughs> I haven't Honest really thought. had a chance to look at all of them, but I've heard there are a lot of executive orders. Um, so I can't, I can't really make an assessment because, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure what he made the executive orders for. But look, a president has every right to sign executive orders. You know, the previous president did executive orders, and every president before him. Um, so, you know, I, I really can't make a comment because I don't know what, you know, what they're about. I haven't really. Okay. Other hot take. State of the state and reopening Michigan. State of the state meaning like Governor Whitmer's address. It, yeah, um, you know the pandemic is real. Um, just to put it out there, I I I, I contracted COVID nineteen with my entire family, so um, I I felt it firsthand. I had two grandparents; they're each eighty three years of age, um, and they had double pneumonia and survived COVID. So. I know that right there, so. now, it is a survivable um, virus, um, but it is a super spreader. So, you know, it, it needs to be controlled. But when you look at statistics, for example, like in New York City, where the restaurant industry um, causes, I think it's a little over 1% of the transmissions and more than 89% of the transmissions are, um, you know, within a home, when you're really polarizing one sector, I, I don't think it's fair. And I probably have this uh, view because I have a lot of people that are in the restaurant industry and restaurant tours are struggling in this state. You know, there's a reason why the real estate industry is booming in states that are open. Now, you know, is the lockdown worth saving lives? Yes. If, if, if the lockdown will save one life, it's worth it. If a lockdown will save one person uh, from contracting a virus, it's worth it. But people have to eat, people have to work, people have families to raise. Um, and, you know, I think that either these governments or, I'm, and, and, you know, not just the United States, but when I say governments, I mean global governments as well, uh, or, you know, governments in, in, in other parts of the world really need to step up and, and, and figure out, you know, if we're going to close a sector of the economy, and leave people without work, you know, how are we going to sustain that for a prolonged period of time? Exactly. Or you know, control the virus. How are we going to control the that's virus? True. That's what I'm saying. And I think that there, there, there was not enough of a plan, like, because Okay, for example, I know that during the uh, George H.W. or not H.W. but George W. Bush administration and Obama administrations, there were there was a lot of protocol on a potential, you know, um, pandemic, and you know people did a lot of pandemic planning, and a lot of that was shared with the World Health Organization, and you know, so there was a strategy in place, but it seems like you know for some reason. It wasn't something that actually, and this is a, a problem with, you know, I don't know, this is why I'm in favor of like a strong government because then it's up to the states that do what you wanna do states, you know, so, but then there was nothing to really give the states this recourse where across the board, we're either going to pay these restaurants or help them in some way, you know, so everybody was like, willy nilly doing whatever they wanted in each state with regard to restaurants. Now, like when you look at Europe, and I'm glad that you keep pointing out like the rest of the world, and you know, there were protocols in place that helps people, you know, they were being paid to stay home, they were being paid to, you know, and, and there was there was help that was given, you know, to industries, especially industries like the restaurant industry. And so, you know, I do think that you know, a lot of this could have been handled a lot better because now businesses are going out. You know, I know there was one of my favorite businesses in Harper Woods left Harper Woods because of the pandemic and they closed. And I mean, you know, I was really trying to like make sure that, you know, they had resources and it's just like, 
but they kept having this shut down, then open, then shut down and open. And I'm like, yes, I agree with you. And, you know, if it saves one life, but I think that, you know, there needed to be more coordinated, more official. Well, and, you know, I think the restaurant. I don't like they're going to suffer the most. I don't, I don't like being an armchair quarterback because, you know, I right. was I wasn't on the front lines. Mm -hmm. I commend Dr. Fauci and I uh, commend, you know, all those frontline workers that really worked hard to controlling this virus. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the whole world was caught off guard by this virus. Um, you know, and the states and the, and the, the you know, the local government and the state government and, uh, you know, the federal, the federal government, you know, had the PPE loans and had, you know, avenues that uh, these, these industries could take to at least, you know, uh, cover the payroll for their employees. Um, you know, they had, you know, different programs like that. And they, they extended, you know, unemployment for people, you know, for a while here in Michigan, you know, they got that, I think it was that extra 600 bucks a week. Um, so that, that all helped, right? Uh, but then we also have to understand that in the United States, we pay a rel relatively lower tax rate than in most of the world. So, you know, I saw somebody post on Instagram that, yeah, Japan is covering everybody's um, salary, but also in Japan, you pay 51% taxes. So, you know, you're only taking home 49% uh, of your money. Um, now, right, right. That is true. That is true. That a, whether, a that's a system or not, whether, whether we want a, a system of social welfare programs, you know, is up for a different discussion, you know, which, which in, in some regards could be admirable in, in themselves. Um, but, you know, the state of affairs currently in the, in the United States, you know, I think that the United States got caught off guard by this virus. Um, love them or hate them, we had a great economy um, during the Trump administration. Um, but I, I fundamentally believe that his Achilles heel was the COVID response. Um, Speaking of Donald Trump, uh, and I'll let you finish that thought. What do you think is next for him? Also, but I do have to say that the Democrat in me will is going to have to say that, oh, yeah, we had a great Trump economy because of Obama. So I had to. Yeah, I had to, and, and, <laughs> and I, I absolutely agree with you a thousand percent. I mean, the economy that Barack Obama inherited and the economy that Donald Trump inherited were, were two different economies. Um, you know, Donald Trump inherited a gold standard economy, which was in ruins when Barack Obama came in. I mean, it's Barack Obama's policies that, you know, saved industry in America. You know, it's Barack Obama's policies that, um, you know, lifted the stock market. You know, it's Barack Obama's policies that created uh, jobs and infrastructure and a lot of new infrastructure in America. So yeah, um, Donald Trump did inherit Barack Obama's economy. Um, and, and it was a great four years for him. And I think that had he not had such a horrible COVID-19 response, that he probably would have been a pretty serious contender against uh, Joe Biden because, you know, Donald Trump is a is is a once in a lifetime politician. Not meaning that once in a lifetime that you know there, there will never be another Donald Trump, but once in a lifetime in that he's a populist figure. You know, there there's been a lot of good and bad politicians that come once in a lifetime that really engage a base. And that base does things that are rational or irrational in their own sense, if you know what I mean. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, like, we know, saw that with the Capitol and, you know, how but, people, like, but, I don't think any other figure, no matter what party, would have ever done anything like that. It's because of the, the type of cult of personality that he was that was, you know, to, was able to galvanize people to think like, oh, okay, he's my guy and I'm going to go fight for him because I don't think nobody would fight for George W. Bush. Nobody would fight for Bill Clinton. You know, like that. Right, right. I, I tend to look at myself as a nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. I do not identify myself with either party. 
Um, I adhere to things in my personal life that are in both party platforms. Um, you know, headphones. <laughs> um, Thanks. They were in the show. When, when, you, when you look at like, when you look at the grace of the White House, let's say you're in the Kennedy administration, you know, and you see, let's say from Watergate on, you know, it's, it's, I just, look, the United States is, in, in my opinion, the greatest country in the world. I'm very fortunate that um, my family made the decision to come here. But the United States has an image to uphold. And uh, not to get too political, but storming a capital. The show is called Quick to Politics. That's what we is, do. Yeah, it is not, you know, whether those people have legitimate grievances or not. You know, because I'm sure there are some of your viewers here that maybe sympathize with their cause. It's not a good look when um, Chairman Chi and 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 um, you know Vladimir Putin or America's enemies are looking and they see this uh, at our you know at our Capitol building. It's not a very good look. Um, so I think that. That was, you know, the final blow to maybe people that were kind of on the fence, you know, maybe um, people who would well, maybe rationalize things, you know, against any other sense. Right. Of, okay, right. well, right. I can I can actually make an excuse for that. I can, you know, understand this. Right. And, you know, so. Yeah, it, it was. It was. There's a lot of. There's a lot of things. Wrong, we, there's a lot of things we can discuss. I mean, people are frustrated. I think legitimately, um, you know, with just the lobby system in the United States government. I mean, when 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 foreign governments can lobby people to, um, you know, push policy. Through, I mean, if, if, if really our, our lobby system is money for policy, then that really means that the normal person doesn't stand a chance. Yeah, where where do we stand, right? And are they are they really fighting for? Are are they really fighting for for the groups they're fighting for, or is that just rhetoric to to to? Uh, is that rhetoric that just? Um, you know, is a, is a, is a call to a base. I, you know, I don't know. That's why it's, I, it's pandering. I, it's really, it's pandering. And I really think that you're, you know, it's, it's right because I think that, you know, uh, I've had a lot of qualms with, you know, I'm not really necessarily thinking I'm going to see something that's amazing. that's going to come out of the Biden administration. I have hope, but at the same time, you know, politics have really changed. And I think that in some ways, you know, even as a Democrat, I do think that I identified more with folks like, you know, Elizabeth Warren and, you know, Bernie Sanders and ALC who are, you know, willing to really fight for the people and who are really, you know, it's not just lip service, you know, they're actually talking the talk. And, you know, I think with this whole kind of, you know, pandering and, you know, big, big lobbyists and special interest groups kind of like having so much say and sway, you know, uh, that to me was a little, I, I'm not necessarily thinking that I'm going to see like so much change really. And I think that has become, you know, big federal politics for the most part. But, um, you know, just to, to shift things um, and close us out, I wanted to ask, like, what do you think is next for Donald Trump? Well, I mean, you know, Donald Trump is a billionaire. He has a very um, successful background. He has a very successful family. Um, you know, Twitter kicked him off, and you know, there's a there's a push to you know take his name off of buildings. And but I mean, the man has assets, you know, all over the world. Um, his family and his, himself had millions of followers online. Um, I think, you know, you know, he, there was some mention of him forming a Patriot Party, I think. So a third party in America, which, I mean, I would welcome a third party, 
uh, whether it was the Patriot Party or the or another party, I would welcome a third party in America. I really would. Um, yeah, I think you know that's the thing. We uh, have this two party system, and you know, I think it really does have to, you know, just kind of. I, I've been asking a lot of my Republican friends. It's like, what is next for the Republican Party? Because I, you know, don't necessarily think that it has the best image right now. And you know, I hope that people can see that something needs to change. And it's, I say the same thing for like the Democratic Party. You know, um, I think when we try so hard to meet centrists and moderates as opposed to, you know, really acknowledging that the most liberal, the most extreme, you know, kind of, or extreme and most liberal um, sort of talking points, which are, you know, universal healthcare and things like that. And, you know, just universal basic income. Why is that extreme when that's with most most people actually are okay with those things and most people actually want just, those and things. Just so I make it clear, like I am against uh, the right or the left, you know, trying to shove their agendas down my throat because personally, right. as an individual, I like to think for myself. Right. You know, I know my I know my personal beliefs, mm -hmm. and and you know, I think that anybody that is looking um to see what their political leniences are needs to really do the research because i know a lot of people that are republicans but they don't know why they're republicans everything they believe in is in the democratic platform and i know democrats that are hardcore democrats and they don't even know why they're a democrat everything in their everything that they believe in is and everything that they follow is is under the uh, republican principles so don't just be a democrat or a Republican because the Democrats and the Republicans tell you to be a Democrat and a Republican. Read the party platform, see what they vote for. You know, ask yourself, you know, what do I want? Where do I stand? And if you're like me, I really don't fit in either camp, to be honest with you. You know, I I lean towards one, I'll, I'll, I'll say that, but I don't, I don't fit 100% in either camp. Um, I fear the extreme right and I fear the extreme left because in, in the United States, politics, um, let's just take since the Second World War. So we'll take the, the 21st century and, um, you know, the, the, the mid part of the 21st century, till, uh, 20th century until now, um, has really been a politics of, of the center. And so, you know, we've, we've um, you know, we've, we've, we've gone very left with some policies, even in history. So, um, the New Deal, Roosevelt's New Deal, uh, was was very left. You know, the FDIC insuring banks, um, Social Security is a a, a very very left um, policy. Which came out of the New Deal. It was it was a it, it was it was during a conservative president and a conservative Supreme Court that Roe versus Wade was upheld. We tend to forget that. Right. And even the Environmental Protection Agency was established during, you know. Environmental Protection Agency was, was yeah, during. So it's like, if you really look historically, you see that these parties have jumped ship uh, left and right. And they, they've definitely shifted. And so now, now, you know, you, you see the, you see that uh, some people might say that the Democratic Party today has elements of the Republican Party of before, and the Republican Party of today has elements of the Democratic Party of, of before. So, you know, just because your dad or your grandpa was a, a Democrat or Republican, respectively, doesn't mean that you need to be one. You need to think for yourself. I think that people need to think for themselves. I think that groups need to think for themselves, um, you know, especially um, minority groups, uh, marginalized groups really need to think for themselves and should not let a political party um, dictate you know uh why they vote for them right right because i mean like in, at the end of the day it's like you're pandering and it goes back to the conversation on like you know having the money and having the lobby and you know are you actually ever really listening to the people who need to be heard the most and right. you know in a lot of cases the answer is no so i think that 
you know, this is where it, I don't know, this is why I do what I do, because I think that people need to be given agency and they need to be educated, you know, and they need to take up their own causes. And this is why I love that a lot of the social justice movements that have happened, you know, particularly last year were because people who are mostly you know, Gen Zers, you know, they decided to like, okay, I know my rights. Okay, I know this. I know that I'm going to educate more people. I'm going to go out there and, you know, protest. I'm going to go and stand up against something that is wrong and, you know, just also fight for the, the right thing. So I think that it really comes down to making sure that, you know, people are not waiting for someone to tell them how to think and how to be. So it really comes down to more, you know, being that person who's going to, you know, stand up for your own self. And like you said, think on your own, but we're, we're okay. all Americans, Ernie, you know, we're all Americans. We, we, we are all after the same goal. There's different roads to that goal, but we're all after the same goal. You and I had fiery debates. You and I agreed on many things. And then we disagreed on a lot of things too. And, and we found a lot of common ground. And I think that essentially that left and right needs to work for the American people and they need to find the common ground, which is something that is non-existent right now in this ultra polarized uh, government. You know, you, you cannot, you cannot efficiently run a government when you are just doing things in spite of the other side. Regardless of what side that is, because I'm not here to, you know, um, throw my chips in for one side, but they really need to find a common ground and a compromise. Right, right, um, right. If you look at some of the best legislation that was ever passed in American history, there was always a compromise. Some, both sides gave up something you know, both sides gave concessions to come to a common goal. You know, it happened with Obamacare and it happened with, you know, Obamacare is just in our recent memory, but it happened with a lot of different things, you know? So, you know, why does it take so long to pass a relief bill? Why when you're passing a relief bill, do you sneak other bills in there? You know, is it, is it, is it the system that's wrong? Is it the individuals? I don't know, but I just hope that you know, I want, I want these United States to be strong. I want them to uh, continue to be um, the, the global superpower. I want them to continue to be um, that last place on earth where marginalized people, the poor, the sick, the weak, um, the, the, the hungry, um, you know, come to this land and find hope and find the American dream, which I think is very much alive. It's alive in me, it's alive in you. And, and, you know, moral of the story is I just, you know, I feel like this government needs to, needs to work um, harder for its citizens. And I, they don't work hard enough. I mean, there's people that have been in public service their whole life. My head goes out to you. And I know people that are in public service and I love what you do. Um, but, you know, we can't get so partisan that we get away from the point that we are Americans. Well, thank you. Those were actually very inspiring words because, you know, I definitely agree with you there. And, um, you know, so it, it really is just going to take that that leveling up and that stepping up. And I think it's, you know, now time for America to do a lot of self-assessing. And I think it, it really did to take the pandemic for us to, you know, be able to look at ourselves honestly and, you know, critique our own selves and critique our own selves because we love the country. And so, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, it was a very fitting way to close things out. Um, where can people find you? And, you know, uh, you know, of course, I'm going to leave it in all of uh, the chat, the doobly-doo and everything else. So um, tell us where we can find you or follow you or all that jazz. So I, I have a, a private page with my name on Instagram, but um, lately I've uh, uh, kind of been switching over to my public platform. So if you look up uh, Diplomat Realtor, on Instagram, you can find me, follow me there, or um, look up Diplomat Realtor uh, on Facebook, uh, follow my page. I've got a very exciting um, Gross Point promo coming out very soon, so I've been saving it for the spring. Um, if I can just do another name drop, my friend Sasha over at Skyview Experts 
uh, did a phenomenal job um, with this uh, promotional video that I'll be launching pretty fast. I'll have a lot of exciting content coming. Um, the future looks very bright for real estate in, uh, especially in Michigan um, and other parts of the United States. Um, I wish the new administration the best of luck. And I hope that um, this new administration um, continues um, uh, the, the economic progress that um, has been made in the past um, 12 years that we have another continued four years and, 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 and eight years of, of, of economic success for everyone. Um, so I leave you guys with that. Follow my page, wait for some exciting content. Um, very, very good things. If I can help anybody with anything, feel free to reach out. If you have any questions, you feel like joining this industry, you're intrigued by it, um, uh, feel free to send me a private message um, and we can discuss, uh, I can send you my number, we can discuss uh, the pros and cons, so. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you very much. And uh, th this has been Nicholas Sinistai. Um, and this has been Quick to Politic. Um, of course, the conversation is always going to be political. And then we sprinkle in a little bit of some other topic <laughs> like real estate. So thank you so much for joining and for watching out there on Facebook. And have a good night. Thank you, Ernie.